Well, this evening we're having a double feature. You are aware of that, right? So there will be two, so I hope that you are well cushioned. <laughs> this is a very serious issue that we're going to talk about. In fact, I think it is a life and death issue. So, very serious. And the only reason why I would have to give a lecture like this is in the first place is because people don't know what the issue is anymore. They've lost sight of the issue, they don't understand the differences anymore, and therefore they can do what they are doing at the moment. And so tonight we're going to, in the first one, have a look at what the real issue is that divides Protestantism and Catholicism. And in the second one, we're going to look at the documents of compromise that have been written and which will be celebrated on the 31st of this month. And what the implications of that are. That, that is the worst part. What is the implication of that? Now, I call this lecture series, Darkness Before Dawn, and you're getting an extract. It's actually a five-part series. You're getting a three-part series. But it's, it's little cover the basics. And tonight we're going to talk about the cornerstone of Protestantism, and you might be wondering what this picture actually means. Well, this is the Church of the Middle Ages, blowing out the light so that you have dark ages. But there's no way that you can prevent the coming of the dawn. There will be a dawn, no matter how much darkness there is in the world. We're living in a very terrible world. And you ask yourself, who's responsible for all the violence in the world? I mean, it's not just religious violence that we see. We see racial violence. We see national violence. We see all of these things happening in the world. High-rise gunman kills at least 58 at Las Vegas concert. What drives a man to just go and shoot into a crowd, injuring hundreds of people and taking so many lives? There must be some form of human insanity that has taken hold of humanity. But Genesis tells us that the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And then we're told as it was then, so will it be in the days just before the coming of Christ. And I think uh, anybody who can read the news or look at the news must realize that we are very close. Now the battle that we are fighting is not a fist fight. It's not a battle that is physical. It shouldn't be. It was physical and it might be physical in some places again. But the fact of the matter is it shouldn't be because it's a battle for the mind. That's what the battle is about. And Martin Luther said it so nicely. He said, Man lasse die Geister aufeinander prallen, aber die Faust haltet stille. Which means, let the spirits, let the minds clash, but keep the fists down. So that's what I want to do tonight. I want to keep the fists down, but I want the minds to clash. We have to look at various ideologies. And let me put my view right there in the front, and I've put it in writing so that nobody can say anything other than what is written there about what I said. This is me. The yellow is me. And I'm going to read it to you. The gospel is the record of what God has done. It is not the record of what God has done in us. Neither is it the record of what God will do in us. The gospel is the record of what God has done outside of us. The gospel is about what God did for us in Christ. 
as soon as I put that little word I in front, I have a problem. What did John the Baptist say? He must increase, I must decrease. And if we do not understand that, then we do not understand uh, the issues fully. Matthew 21 verse 24 says, Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Acts repeats it. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. The Bible and the story in the Bible is about Christ. That's what the story is about. As Martin Luther put it so nicely, he said, you better choose sides. You better hide behind the devil or you hide behind Christ. Don't try and come between the two and try and be the peacemaker. You will be crushed to smithereens between the two because the enmity is such that there is no other way than the total obliteration of either one or the other. Choose. Hide behind one. So what led to the Protestant Reformation? Well, the Protestant Reformation was just a final culmination. There were many things that happened before. The Waldensians, the Albigensians, the, the Celts, you name it. There were many, many that came before. Uh, Wycliffe, the Hussites. In fact, the Hussites were so marvelous, it's just unbelievable what they already realized. But what triggered Martin Luther was the selling of indulgences. And the questioning of indulgences led to the inquiry of how is a man forgiven? This in turn leads to another question, how is a man justified before God? Which leads to a confrontation with Rome. Because the question is how are you forgiven? In reality, indulgences are the end result of a complex theological labyrinth all centered around this one little word, forgiveness, and the mission of Jesus Christ and the gospel of salvation. So it started with indulgences. Now if you say indulgences today, most people don't have a clue what it means. They think that indulgence means that you have been forgiven a certain sin or group of sins. That's an indulgence. That's not an indulgence. Indulgence is something totally different. We'll have to look at it. This was Johannus, Janus, and of course he was burnt at the stake. And he, a hundred years before Martin Luther, despised indulgences. And here's one of the posters of Jan Hus's period where you have these letters of indulgences in the hand of the devil. So they were pretty adamant of showing what they thought about indulgences. And Jan Hus also nailed points against the church door. In fact, the Bethlehem church in Prague. And his points were far more comprehensive than Martin Luther's. Indulgence was just one of them. He had the mass on there. He had the papal power on there. He had forgiveness on there. He had the whole plethora. And they burnt him at the stake. And when he was being taken to the stake, he said, In 100 years' time, there will arise a man and you will not be able to silence him like you are silencing me today. And almost to the day, a hundred years later, Martin Luther nailed his indulgence theses against the Wittenberg church door. Now, what was it all about? And how did it come about? And what is the cornerstone of Protestantism? Well, the cornerstone of Protestantism is the following. Romans 10 verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It's a very important verse in the Bible. 
Where does faith come from? Hearing. Hearing what? The Word of God. So what is the centrality that I have to deal with in the first place? It is the Word of God. Not my feeling, not my conjectures, not my ideologies. It's the Word of God. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. So this faith must be very important. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So I was in trouble there in the beginning, right? As an atheist. John 16 verse 8, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and then of sin because they believe not on me. Now we love the verse that says sin is the transgression of the law. That's the one half of the story. The other half of the story is sin is not believing Jesus Christ. That's sin. In other words, the wages of sin is what? Death. So not believing this leads to what? Death. This is a very important issue. So I must have faith. But I don't have faith of myself. I have to get it as a gift. So even the faith that I have is a gift. When I was an atheist, I had zero faith. How did I suddenly get faith out of nothing? You can't create anything out of anything, out of nothing, unless it is given to you. Galatians 3 verse 2, This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The question is an obvious question. Obviously, is implying that you do not, do not receive the Spirit by the works of the law, but by the hearing of faith. Galatians 3.22, But the Scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Now, there's another interesting point. When you read in the King James Bible, it always speaks about the faith of Jesus. When you read in the modern Bibles, it speaks about the faith in Jesus. Now there's a massive difference between the two. And grammatically, it's written in the genitive, so it has to be grammatically the faith of Jesus and not the faith in Jesus. Because let's analyze that. The faith in Jesus, whose faith is it then? It's mine. The faith of Jesus, whose faith is it then? His. So this is a very important distinction. Whose faith is it? It's his faith. Did I have any faith when I was an, at an atheist? Yes or no? So how did I get faith? It must have been given by hearing. Hearing what? Hearing the word of God. And therefore, who gave me the faith? He did. So whose faith have I got? His even the faith belongs to him. And if my faith is like a mustard seed, I can pray, Lord, increase my faith. Who's increasing it then, me or him? Him. And how does he increase it? By giving me more of the word of God and giving me a better understanding of the word of God and then all the other things that come with it. But the faith is always from him. So there's a true gospel and there's a false gospel. Revelation 14, 6 says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people. Everybody needs to hear this. The everlasting gospel. Now, why would the world have to hear the everlasting gospel here at the end of time? Because this is an end time message according to the prophetic picture in which it is. Because people have lost sight of what the everlasting gospel is. Now, if it's an everlasting gospel, can it be a changing gospel? No. It must be one gospel and it must be everlasting. What does the world teach today? What do most evangelical churches teach today? Dispensationalism. What is dispensationalism? That there were different kinds of salvation over time. So there was a dispensation of law when you were saved by keeping the law. 
there was a dispensation of grace, which we are now under, according to this philosophy, where you are saved by grace. Now, if I was a Jew, and I was judged by the law, and I failed, and I come across a Christian who's going to heaven because he doesn't have to keep the law, he's under grace, I would be very peeved with God and say, excuse me, don't you have double standards? Why do you apply one standard to me and one standard to them? Well, what about the idea in modern theology that the last generation gets a double chance and nobody else prior got it? And I'd say, excuse me, hello, why does he get two chances and I only get one? There's something wrong here. The Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So how was a Jew saved? He was saved by the blood of the Lamb. Because he had to put his hands on the head of the lamb. He had to confess his sins. The blood had to flow. He had to kill the lamb. And in type, his sins were transferred to the lamb. And then in type to the high priest, representing Jesus Christ. So a Jew was saved by the blood of the lamb. How was Cain and Abel? How were they supposed to be saved? By the blood of the lamb. And Abel decided, okay, I will bring a lamb. And I will sacrifice a lamb without blemish, which represents the, my Messiah who is to come. And Cain said, excuse me, what's wrong with the works of my hands? Here are the works of my hands. And God didn't accept his, his uh, offering. And ever since then, Cain has been slaying Abel. Ever since then. And all the wars that we've had in the world, in the Christian world, have just simply been exactly that. Cain slaying Abel. Because there are two possibilities. Now can you marry these two? That is the problem. Can you marry these two? Can there be another gospel? 2 Corinthians 11.4 For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached or if you receive another spirit which you have not received or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So people love to bear with another gospel, it seems. And then he talks to the Galatians and he says to them, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you un into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Is it possible to preach more than one gospel according to these verses? Absolutely. It's possible. Is it possible to be pervert the gospel of Christ? Absolutely. So we must make sure that this doesn't happen. Let's have a look at a very important issue in the gospel. And that is the question of atonement. Atonement is a very beautiful word. It comes from Tyndall, who coined this phrase, because he didn't know how to translate it. And so he translated it, atonement, which means at one -ment, To be one again. It's a very beautiful word. Other languages have other words, but uh, the English says it very nice. The German says versöhnung. Anyway, so if you look at the New World Encyclopedia, atonement means two parties estranged from each other because one of them offends the other. Eventually reconciled to each other, it usually contains two stages. The offender's act of expiation or forgiveness from the offended party and the reconciliation, which is a regained state of unity thereafter. So that is atonement. And Tyndall is the father of that word. Now, how does this work in the Bible? I'm a sinner. And the, the law condemns me to death. I have to die. And here comes one who has life within himself and who has humanity corporately in him because he was the originator of humanity. So the only one who could die for corporate humanity would be the one who originated humanity. No, anal, no angel can die for me. No other human can die for me because you have to die for your own sin and I have to die for my own sin. But here was one who had 
humanity corporately in him before Adam was even created. He could pay the price and he chooses to pay the price. And now the Bible says, whom God has set forth as a propitiation. What a beautiful word. The Greek is hilasterion. Through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, by the law of faith. I'm a saved, according to the text. Through faith in the blood of the Lamb, I am. Claim the promise and God imputes his righteousness to me. Whose righteousness? His. Can't be mine because I don't have any. I'm dead in transgression. So this is basically how it works. The wages of sin is death. Sin is the transgression of the law. The price is death. So what would the price have to be? be in order to justify or to let justice prevail. Death. Death. So the question is, did Jesus have to die in order to pay the price for me, yes or no? You have to be sure about this. If the wages of sin is death, then the penalty for sin is death, and justice demands death. And therefore, death is the only way in which this price can be paid. The only way. Fine. So it's his righteousness and it's faith in his blood. That's what the scriptures say. So what is this little word propitiation? It means the turning away of wrath by an offering in relation to soteriology, that is salvational science, Propitiation means placating or satisfying the wrath of God by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. This comes from Ryrie's basic theology, and it's a, a correct understanding of what it means. And we have to understand this. It's very, very important. Also, very interesting, it means the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the same word. Now, the mercy seat was above the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments condemn me to death. The mercy seat is above it. It's made of pure gold. It represents Christ who shields me from the condemnation of the law, he having taken that condemnation upon himself. And it is his throne. It is his seat. So the seat of God, the mercy seat, is above the law. And it is his mercy that shields me from the condemnation of the law. So you have various seats. You have the seat of Moses and you have the seat of power of the governments of this world and the religious authorities. Now let's have a look how salvation works in the other religions of the world. In contrast, the principle that man is able to save himself through his own efforts, through his works, that's the religion of who? Cain or Abel? Right? It's part of Every non-religious, non-Christian religion. So if you look at Islam and you check up on their uh, sources, it says since God is almighty, he doesn't need the charade concocted by Christians in order to forgive man. In the Quran, God says we are all created in a state of goodness. The Bible says we are all in a state of what? The whole head is sick. There's nothing sound in me. So the Bible says the opposite. So here we have two documents that are the opposite. He has not burdened man with any original sin, having forgiven Adam and Eve as he forgives us. As we are all personally responsible for our actions, there is no need for a humanly concocted savior in Islam. Salvation comes from God alone. That's Islam. Okay, let's check it out. Here's the Quran. Quran, Surah 4, verse 125, etc. 
Who can be better in religion than one who submits his whole self to God, does good, and follows the way of Abraham, the true in faith? So, you have to do good. Oh, people of the book, now it's talking to Christians. Commit no excess in your religion, nor say of God aught but the truth. Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of God, for God is one God, glory be to him. Far exalted is he above having a son. To him belong all things in the heavens and on earth, and enough is God as a disposer of affairs. You don't need the story about Jesus. So says the Quran. Okay, what about Buddhism? Well, Buddhism is basically an atheistic religion because there is no personal God in Buddhism. There is just a collective whole. And nirvana means the absolute state of nothingness. Nothingness. So Buddhism is far from theistic. It has no real concept of atonement with God. It rather focuses on atonement with fellow humans, teaching the importance of forgiveness. So we forgive each other, and that's how it works. There is no need for a sacrifice. There is no need for an atonement. So Buddhism doesn't have it. Islam doesn't have it. Christianity has it. Now my question is, is there a true Christianity with a true gospel, and is there a false Christianity with a false gospel? That's the question. So let's have a look at the Roman Catholic view of atonement. And you must understand now that two people can sit next to each other and use the word atonement and mean something totally different. And if you don't understand that, you can get confused by terminology. This is what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. This is the Reformed view, they say. <coughs> you have God the Father. You have wrath. And you have the cross. This is the Catholic view. God the Father, self-sacrificing love, and you have the cross. Sounds much nicer. Sounds much nicer, but is it biblical? <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's have some look, look at some other sources to make it clearer. Alan Jones, the reverend at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, write, wrote this book, Reimagining Christianity. And he says the following. The church's fixation on the death of Jesus as the universal saving act must end. And the place of the cross must be reimagined in Christian faith. Why? Because of the cult of suffering and the vindictive God behind it. Of the atonement, John says, Jesus' sacrifice was to appease an angry God. Penal substitution was the name of this vile doctrine. Okay. So, as I heard one man say, thank you. As I heard one man say, in this case, we must love the Son, but we must hate the Father. But Jesus said, I and the Father are one. So the sacrifice was a sacrifice by the entire deity. Was God, not in, God the Father not involved at that sacrifice? And why was it necessary for Jesus to die? And why does Reformed theology say it was absolutely essential for my salvation that he should die? We need to figure that out. Because the Roman Catholic thinking is, Jesus didn't have to die. There was no penal substitution. It's a vile doctrine. Uh, let's make sure, right? We really have to be sure. So let's ask Richard Leonard. He's a Sydney-based Jesuit priest, and he's also the director of the Australian Catholic Film Office, and he says of the atonement. There's an interview with him. What to say to the suffering and death was interesting. But I found Richard's comments on the atonement around such and such particularly so. He says, In the top ten hymns of the Christians right throughout the world, I think how great their art gets into the top five almost every time. 
And indeed, I love how great they are. We sang it at Mass only just recently, and I gave it out with great gusto, but I can't sing verse 3. I wander through glades in verse 1, and I shout with acclamation in verse 5, but verse 3 says, And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. Well, I can scarce take it in too because I don't believe that sort of theology. There's no atonement in Catholicism. It comes in a very particular moment in Catholic theology called the atonement theory of the 11th century and it's based on Paul's letter to Romans so it's got some New Testament roots. He doesn't care about the fact that it's in the Bible. But when you unpack those parts in the New Testament, they are used in a very particular way that I think have lost their meaning now by buying back slaves and the whole process of redemption and then it gets picked up about atonement and then the Protestant reformers really perfect it in what's called satisfaction theology. That's the only way for God to get happy with the world was the perfect son to make the perfect sacrifice so God's anger would be satisfied. There's another way that you could look and get into what Jesus, why Jesus died, and that is, why was Jesus killed? And I say in the book that maybe it's just more helpful now to say that Jesus didn't come primarily to die, he came to live. And as a result of the way he lived, he threatened the religious, political, and social leaders of the day so much that they put him to death. And then he talks about Good Friday and that God's response to Good Friday is Easter Sunday. So I love how great their art. I just shut up when it gets to verse 3. I know it's a very venerable piece of theology, but for instance, the Orthodox Christians, they have not gone down that atonement way, that satisfaction way. They tend to be much stronger about what I've just outlined, that Jesus came to live. You see, when Christians go to Holy Week, etc., 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 etc. So let me give you, in a nutshell, what Catholicism teaches about atonement. Jesus did not come to die for you. He never paid the price for your sin. He came to live. He came and lived the perfect life. He was the perfect, obedient son. And God looked upon the perfect, obedient son and said, My son, you are so wonderfully obedient that because of your obedience, I'm willing to forgive the sinner. So not his death, but his obedience makes it possible for you to go to heaven. But it gets worse, as we will see later on. Now, Let's just carry on and see what the Bible says. Colossians 1.14 In whom we have redemption how? Through his blood even the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1.20 And having made peace through the blood of the cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unprovable in his sight. And Hebrews goes on and says, Paul says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. According to the scripture, how are you saved? By the perfect life of Jesus or by the death of Jesus on the cross? What's the Bible say? You need to know. By his death. That's biblical. Catholicism is not Biblical. It has another theory. It gets worse, and I'll show you later. Now, what do Adventists believe? Here's an Adventist source. The Son of God, undertaking to become the Redeemer of the race, placed Adam in a new relation to his Creator. 
He was still fallen, but a door of hope was open to him. The wrath of God still hung over Adam, but the execution of the sentence of death was delayed, and the indignation of God was restrained because Christ had entered upon the work of becoming man's redeemer. Christ was to take the wrath of God, which in justice should have fallen upon man. He became a refuge for man. And although man was indeed a criminal, deserving the wrath of God, yet he could by faith in Christ run into the refuge provided and be safe. In the midst of death there was life if man chose to accept it. This Adventist source, is it biblical, yes or no? Absolutely, it's Reformed theology. So in terms of atonement, Adventism is Reformed theology. Now let's look at justification. How do I become just before God? I'm a sinner. I'm a justified. Romans 3.28 Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Without the deeds of the law. When, the, when it comes to justification, that is a judicial term. It's a juridical terminology. It means to be declared just. Even though you have no justice, it is a singular act. There's nothing that I contribute to it. Now Rome accused Martin Luther of deliberately inserting the word alone into this text. And Rome actually is correct that Martin Luther added the word alone. But let's look at his text. So if you look at this there, so halten wir nun dafür, dass der Mensch gerecht werde ohne des Gesetzes Werke allein durch den Glauben. So if we read it in the English, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith alone without the deeds of the law. Now, why did Martin Luther add the word alone because he wanted to emphasize the context of the verse. So let me give you a parallel verse. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of law but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Can you see that it again is the faith of Jesus Christ there? It's very important. So does that imply that it is by faith alone? Yes or no? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it is justified to put the word alone in there, although it might not specifically have been in the original Greek text. But the Bible is very clear that you are justified by faith alone. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. It's pretty clear that it is by faith alone. There's nothing wrong with the word alone. We need to get that clear into our minds. So this is the church in Wittenberg. And here on the door they've reconstructed the 95 Theses. Of course, it was a wooden door in those days, but that was burnt down by the French. And if you go and stand on the pulpit inside the church, then that verse that we just read is right here, and there is the little word, alone. That's the centerpiece of Protestantism. So the whole of Protestantism hinges on one word, and that word is the word alone. Can you imagine how many people have died because of the word alone? Millions, because of one word. Millions. So what was the central pillar of the Reformation? Martin Luther. When it comes to the article of justification by faith alone, JBFA, nothing can be yielded or surrendered, nor can anything be granted or permitted contrary to the same. Martin Luther, if the article of justification is lost, all Christian doctrine is lost at the same time. The doctrine is the head and the cornerstone. It alone begets, nourishes, builds, preserves, defends the church of Christ. And without it, 
the church of God cannot exist for one hour. When the article of justification has fallen, everything has fallen. That's Protestantism. That's biblical Protestantism. What was cursed at the Council of Trent when Rome condemned the Reformation? Quote, Anyone who says that sinners are justified by faith alone so as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order and to obtain the grace of justification. Now we're not talking sanctification. We're talking justification. Just the word justification. Let him be an anathema. So he's cursed. Anyone who says that sinners are justified by the sole imputation of the righteousness of Christ or by the sole remission of sins without the charity, that's the good works, which are shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost, let him be an anathema. So you're cursed if you say that you are saved by faith alone. So I guess Paul is cursed, right? Paul is cursed. I, if I had to take my choice as to who I want to stand with who is cursed, uh, I think Paul would rate quite highly. I think I'd take my chances. So Martin Luther nailed his thesis to the church door and he complained about indulgences. Now we need to understand how Catholics think. I was Catholic, so I know how Catholics think. I'm Protestant now, and I have to make sure I know what Protestants think. Otherwise, I'm going to have a problem. I'm going to have a dichotomy. I need to understand Catholic theology if I want to be strong in Protestant theology. There's no other way. But if we're throwing around words, justification and atonement and all of these things, and we think, well, this is great. They're, they're saying the same as we are. And they have a totally different theology, and I don't even know. Isn't that deceptive, yes or no? Okay, let's have a look at it, because this is, gets very fascinating. It's all started with Johann Tetzel, who was selling indulgences. You know, the church needed money to rebuild St. Peter's, so they sold an indulgence. And today, modern people think indulgence means you forget your sins forgiven. It has nothing to do with the forgiveness of sins. You get your sins forgiven, according to Catholicism, by going to the priest and confessing your sins. But Catholicism has another twitch to that. Catholicism says you get your sins forgiven, but you don't get the consequences taken away. So what is an indulgence? An indulgence is a purchase of time off for the suffering that you have to undergo for the consequences of your sin. And that you need to understand. Your indulgence does not purchase you forgiveness here. You get that quite easily by just going to the priest and confessing your sin. It's gone. But the consequences remain. In other words, Catholic theology says that Christ never took the consequences of your sin upon himself. You have to bear them yourself. And you're going to bear them. And you might have your sin forgiven here by the priest, but when you get to heaven, you're sitting with a pile of consequences. What are you going to do? Sorry, pal, you can't go to heaven. You haven't paid the price for your sins yet. So what did they invent in order for you to be able to pay that price? You can't go to heaven. You haven't paid the consequences. What must you do? So they invent an in-between place where you go to pay the consequences, and that place is called purgatory. There's no mention of purgatory in the Bible, but Catholicism teaches you go to purgatory and there you suffer for your sins. And there's a special way in which you can get relief from that suffering, but you can only get it from the church. In fact, you can only get it from the Pope. And then you can buy that relief and you can get out. Now, how do I get it? I must give God something in the place of that which I messed up on. And that is good works. But the good works weren't mine, so the good works must come from someone else. They can come from Jesus. They can come from Mary. They can come from a saint. 
And that good work can be accredited to me, but the only one who can hand it out is the Pope. This is Catholic theology. I'm going to prove it to you. So let me give you a little example. It's a stupid example, but it'll make the point. Let's say I have been very mean to my wife. I know I've used this before, but I'm going to use it again because it makes a point. A little allegory. I've been very mean to my wife and she's been crying for three weeks. I've never done that in my entire life, of course. Do you believe me? With my sinful nature? Nevertheless, my conscience worries me. And I go to her and I say to her, I'm terribly sorry for what I did. Can you please find it in your heart to forgive me? And she gives me a hug and says, okay, I forgive you. And a weight drops off my shoulders. And I walk away and the next minute I get a blow to my head that I stagger in the room. She's taken a frying pan and s virtually smashed my skull in. And I turn around and I say, what the heck was that for? And she says, well, I forgave you, but you still have to bear the consequences. So these are the consequences, and now we quits. That would be great for our relationship, right? Or would it be a disaster? It would be a disaster. And the question is, did Jesus just die, or did he do good works, but did he... If the cross wasn't necessary for me, then he couldn't have paid and borne the consequences of my sin either. So in Catholic theology, Christ never died for you, and Christ never bore the consequences of your sin. And this is a serious issue. He never did that. He just did good works, which can be reassessed. So let me, let me show you this. Here was a typical indulgence. And now let's have a look at the Catholic understanding of justification and the imputation of merit. The papacy teaches that there is something called the treasury of merit. And this consists of the super... This is their, their teaching. This is Roman Catholic teaching direct. This consists of the superabundant merits of Christ, as well as the merits of the saints. The treasury of merit is one because of the communion of saints in the body, Christ being the head. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches the following about the treasury of merit. We also call these spiritual goods the communion of saints, the church's treasury, which is not the sum total of the material goods which have accumulated during the course of century. On the contrary, the treasury of the church is of infinite value, which can never be exhausted, which Christ's merits have before God. They were offered so that the whole of mankind could be set free from sin and attain communion with the Father. Let's go to the Catechism Direct. Here's the Catechism of the Catholic Church. In Christ, the Redeemer himself, the satisfactions and merits of his redemption exist and find their efficacy. This treasury includes as well the prayers and good works of the Blessed Virgin Mary. They are truly immense, unfathomable, even pristine in their value before God. In the treasury too are the prayers and good works of all the saints. All those who have followed in the footsteps of Christ the Lord and by his grace made their lives holy and carried out the mission in the unity of the mystical body. So this is how it works. Catholicism teaches that God has entrusted the treasury of merit to distribute to the church, to the Pope alone. He has access to the treasury of merit. What is in his basket of merit? The good works of Jesus, but also the good works of Mary, and also the good works of all the saints. That's what's in his treasury. Now here comes miserable little me. 
and I have committed numerous sins and I go to the priest and my sins are forgiven but I still have to bear the consequences so now I can look to the church I can look to the Pope and I can say can you help me and he says yes I have the power to do that I can give you an indulgence you can pay me for it or I can you can do something for it I'll give you an indulgence and then what I'll do for you I'll take my scoop and I'll scoop out of the treasury of merit and I'll put it to your account then you have to pay less when you get to purgatory you get a time off are you with me question who dispenses the grace God or the Pope so who becomes my God of grace you must be sure on this one the Pope becomes my God of grace because only through him can I now have this gift of salvation because only through him can I get forgiveness because Catholic theology says the sentence or the absolution of the priest precedes and God subscribes to it so if the priest does not wish to forgive me I'm lost forever my salvation depends on the church because God according to their theology has given the treasury of merit to them to dispense without them I can do nothing but Jesus says without him I can do nothing this is a very serious issue they say merit cannot be transferred but meritorious acts can make satisfaction for another let me give you another silly example merit cannot be transferred but meritorious acts can make satisfaction you, you have two sons you come home the one was angry with you he smashed your windscreen he smashed your computer with his baseball bat in a fit of rage but the other one cut the lawn and uh, tidied up the house so I come home and I say excuse me what happened here and I find out my one son smashed my windscreen and destroyed my computer and I look at my other son and I see Ooh, he cut the lawn and he did all these wonderful things you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna take some of that merit and I'm gonna give it to this one and I say it's okay you can go does that make any sense but this is Catholic doctrine so meritorious acts can make satisfaction for another by giving to God a gift great of greater value than that which was taken by the sin this is how Christ's own action in his passion and death made satisfaction for the sins of the whole world but it is also the way the meritorious acts of the Saints can make satisfaction for others debt of temporal punishment st. Thomas Aquinas writes the following all the Saints intended that whatever they did or suffered for God's sake should be profitable not only to themselves but to the whole church who becomes my Savior all the Saints all the Saints and Jesus but the works of Mary are pristine is this the gospel yes or no all right so we have two atonements in the world one with Jesus as we sing Jesus paid it all all to him I owe not only did he pay the price for my, trans my transgression which is death but he bore the consequences and it squeezed the life out of him I owe him everything I don't have to go to purgatory I don't have to get bonked over the bean with a frying pan he forgives me and I accept by faith this wonderful gift of salvation that's the biblical story you can choose which one you want and they continue the treasure he neither wrapped up in a napkin nor hid it in a field but entrusted it to the blessed Peter just to make sure that you understand Catholic doctrine the key bearer and his successor that they might for just and reasonable causes distribute it to the faithful in full or partial remission of temporal punishment due to sin not forgiveness of sin only the consequences of the sin can be released this is Catholic doctrine 
So their concept of salvation is totally different to the biblical concept of salvation. Totally different. That's why it's not wrapped up in Christ alone. They only look at the sacrifice in terms of this obedience to the point of death, which is so meritorious that they can scoop from it. I don't have to read it all. I think you've got the point. Have you got the point? Good. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. How do you get to the Father according to Catholicism? Through the system and through the Pope. The only way. I have to get my forgiveness there and I have to get my merit assigned to me there. And only the Pope can do it. So the, the system is absolutely necessary for salvation. Absolutely. Outside the system, you're lost. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heaven laven, and I will give you rest. Here's a personal deity. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Where does a Catholic have to go for this mercy? To what throne must he go to find it? He must go to the papal throne. This is Catholic theology. Now, does it still apply today? Because it seems as if the Protestant world is saying, well, Rome has changed. I just read to you their current doctrine out of their own catechism. And here is the Pope, plenary indulgence for the year of faith, 24 hours of forgiveness. What does this mean? This was the previous Pope. The Roman Catholic Diocese of Fresno Preparing for World Youth Day. Indulgences granted by Pope Francis for World Youth Day. What does this mean? As part of the greater effort to use social media to connect with Catholics worldwide, the Pope will start relieving punishment for your sins, in other words, the consequences, via social media. According to the Vatican, sacred apostolic penitentiary publication, Pope Francis will be giving a plenary indulgence, which is a special act that is said to reduce time in purgatory. To his Twitter followers, the Pope typically offers indulgences to those who see him in person, but for the first time this year, it will be extended to virtual visits too. Now, at the risk of sounding sarcastic, this is the Pope who says he cares so much about the poor. But the only one who can get an indulgence are those who can afford a cell phone and an internet connection so that they can follow him on Twitter. So salvation by Twitter. Vatican offers time of purgatory to followers of Pope Francis's tweets. This is not a joke, this is reality. My question, Protestants, can you align yourself with a system that has a totally different concept of salvation, yes or no? This is the question. Has Rome changed in this regard, yes or no? Do we have to nail the 95 Thesis onto the church door again, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Now, not all Protestants are blind. And here is the Christian witness to Roman Catholicism. This is a Protestant web page. Now, as you've probably all figured out by now, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And most people think that Seventh-day Adventists are some kind of weird sect. But I just want to tell you that we stand firmly behind Reformed theology. And why? Because it's the only theology that's biblical. That's why. Most of the Christian world knows that something dramatic happened in Augsburg, Germany on October the 31st, 1517. On that day, an obscure monk named Martin Luther ambled up to the north door of the castle at Wittenberg and nailed 95 theses to the door. Everybody knows that. What many Christians may not know is that on October the 31st, 1999, and we heard that last night, 
482 years after Luther lodged his process, another dramatic event took place at the very site. Choosing the very same day and location of Luther's challenge, representatives of the Roman Catholic religion and the Lutheran World Federation signed an agreement titled the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. Hailed by some enthusiasts as the end to Roman Catholic's Protestant divide, this document has received much press and attention world over. Here is the signing of the Joint Declaration on Justification, which was signed by the Lutherans and the Roman Catholic Church on the 31st of October 1999. Then the Methodists also signed it. And I see that the Methodists have just had an audience with the Pope where they said that the full unity is now possible. Just this week. So the Methodists to join Declaration on Justification. This is Zenit, this is the world, this is Roman Catholic source. And then on the 6th of July 2017, everything has to be done before the 31st. I mean, we only have a couple of days left, right? The World Communion of Reformed Churches joined the Catholic Lutheran Agreement on Justification. So all the big Protestant churches have now signed the Joint Declaration on Justification. Now I want you to think, justification in the mind of a Protestant is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ attributed to you by imputation. It's not yours, it's his. He paid the full price for your transgression by paying the price through his blood. Reformed theology. Catholic theology, totally the opposite. Okay? The World Council of Reformed Churches, well, it's one, it's one of the largest associations of Reformed Churches. And uh, after the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Anglican Community, and the Methodist Council, which have all agreed to this, it represents some 80 million Christians in the Congregational Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Reformed Church, the United, Uniting, and Valdensian Churches in 108 countries. So all the Calvinists are in there. Everybody has now signed this joint declaration. But then they say that the joint declaration is not representative of the conservative wing of the Lutheran Church. So there are still some Lutherans who are thinking about this. The purpose in writing the joint declaration is stated right in their document. It says, the present joint declaration has the intention namely to show that on the basis of their dialogue, the subscribing Lutheran churches and the Roman Catholic Church are now able to articulate a common understanding of our justification by God's grace through, the faith, in, through faith in Christ. It does not cover all that either churches teach about justification. Now, let me just reiterate. The central pillar of Protestantism is justification by faith alone. The appearance of consensus on the issue of justification created by the joint document is due to a play on semantics. And it amounts to an abandonment of the reformed position. This is what the conservative Protestants are saying. Now last night we looked at a clip where Kenneth Copeland was saying that the division was actually the result of demonology. That's what he basically said. God took that evil spirit by the throat and he cast down that demon. And here they all are at the Pope, all these Protestant representatives, now being able to join up with them because this document has been signed. The Ark community played a very important role. The Ark community is a Protestant Pentecostal group that is associated with the Vatican because they believe that the Vatican in its Pentecostal activity has shows the same spirit as they show, so therefore they must be one. Now this is the current representative. The previous representative was Tony Palmer, and he died in a motor car accident. Now this was Tony Palmer speaking to a world gathering of charismatics, uh, in Kenneth Copeland's center a while ago and he made this appeal 
which ended up in everybody going to the Pope and which will now culminate on the 24th of this month, as you, Tony, as uh, Kenneth Copeland said yesterday, on this meeting of all the religions so that everything is ready by the 31st for the unity celebration. We're living in a very serious time. What does this mean? I'm going to play you a little extract of his speech so that you can just get the gist of it. I know he's dead, but he's very much alive in what Kenneth Copeland said yesterday. So listen carefully. I've come to understand that diversity is divine. It's division that's diabolic. It's true what you were saying about the glory. I agree with you, of course it's true. The glory that the Father had, he gave to Jesus. The glory was the presence of God. What is the charismatic renewal? It's when we experience the presence of God. And he said, and I give them the glory, pragmatic reason, so that they may be one. It's the glory that glues us together, not the doctrines. Listen. It's the glory. If you accept that Christ is living in me and the presence of God is in me and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrines when we get upstairs. <laughs> Therefore, Christian unity is the basis of our credibility because Jesus said until they one, they will not believe. The world will not believe, as they should, until we are one. Division destroys our credibility. Now, why is it historic? Because in 1999, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Lutheran Church signed an agreement that brought an end to the protest. Luther believed that we were saved by grace through faith. Alone? Amen. But that's not it. The Catholic Church believed that we were saved by works. And that was the protest. In 1999, they wrote this together. Because in the Protestant church, we had a lot of cheap salvations. People were getting born again, but no fruit whatsoever. And because we didn't even look for fruit, it wasn't the issue. Because it wasn't necessary for salvation. And no, it's not. But it's a good judge if you are saved. So what these two churches did, they put the two definitions together. Listen to it. I'm reading verbatim from the Catholic Vatican website. Justification means that Christ himself is our righteousness, in which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. To, together we Catholics and Protestants, Lutherans, believe and confess that by grace alone, in faith, in Christ's saving works, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. This brought an end to the protest of Luther. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours. All right, did it sound good? Most people will say that sounded very good. If you don't understand Catholic theology, that's why I spent half of this lecture explaining Catholic theology, you will not understand that this is from the pits of hell. I can't put it more bluntly than that. You won't understand. So we have to analyze it. But he said something else too. He said, if you accept that the Spirit of God is in me through the manifestations that you see, and I accept that the Spirit of God is in you because I see the same manifestations, that's all we need. God will sort out our doctrines when we come get upstairs. We don't need doctrine. That's what he said. So let's first look at that little part. Alfred H. Paul wrote a book. He belonged to the charismatic movement, and he wrote a book, 17 Reasons Why I Left the Tongues Movement. And I'm going to read you a small portion. I wish that I were wrong, but all signs at the present indicate that the charismatic movement 
could be the common denominator for a worldwide ecumenical organization or church. In the past, all attempts to bring about ecumenicity on the basis of faith, belief, or doctrine have failed. But in the charismatic movement, unity is attained not by unanimity of doctrine, but on the basis of a common religious experience. To them, largely, doctrine is not an important thing, as we just heard. But the experience is. So it is not surprising that in the charismatic circles, people of many denominational and backgrounds and doctrines can all worship and fellowship together. Not because they agree on doctrine, but because they agree on a common religious experience. This is a very dangerous trend. Why? Because setting truth aside in order to have unity will ultimately put the one who is the truth, the Lord Jesus, outside of the movement. This is a very wise statement. The Reformation said, sola scriptura, my faith must be based on what the word says. He says doctrine is not important. So what did, the, what did Tony Palmer say? We Protestants who signed the declaration are not protesting the doctrine of salvation by the Catholic Church anymore. We now preach the same gospel. And then he said, we now preach you are saved by grace through faith alone. The word alone was argued for 500 years. The word alone is there. You can read it yourself. The protest is over. The protest is over. I challenge you to find a bridge builder, etc. Okay, let's read it together. Knowing Catholic doctrine, let's read it together. Together we confess by grace alone in faith in Christ's saving work. And not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our heart while equipping and calling us unto good works. First point. By grace alone is not the same as by faith alone. It's very cleverly worded. It's by grace alone. If you're a Catholic, where do you go to for grace? You go to the church, you go to the Pope, you need an indulgence, you need to get time off. That's where you find your grace. If you're a Protestant, where do you go to for grace? To Christ. Can you touch him? Can you see him? Can you experience him? No, you have to accept it by what? By faith. So what is predominant, the grace or the faith? The faith is a? contribution, but you can only get it through faith. Faith is the number one thing. The Protestant doctrine was by faith alone, not by grace alone. So this Protestant website actually picked it up. By grace alone is not the same as faith alone. Not with, notice, not because of any merit on our part, does not exclude merit produced by the Spirit of God. Notice, receiving the Holy Spirit is not defined. Rome believes that the Holy Spirit is called down in the waters of infant baptism and imprinted in confirmation. Christians do not. But there's something else they didn't pick up on in this definition. We confess that by grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving work, that's why I've highlighted it, and not because of any merit on our part, because what do Catholics believe? That Jesus didn't what? It didn't die for you. The definition doesn't say, by faith alone, in Christ's atoning sacrifice, Christ's atoning blood. This is a totally Catholic definition, read with Catholic eyes, and with uninformed Protestant eyes, it looks okay. Aren't we being duped here? Aren't we being duped? The Reformation was fought over the word alone. The formula for the Reformation was sola fide, faith alone. Now here's an ex-Roman Catholic, and uh, this is a Catholic priest who became a Protestant, and he heads the Berean Beacon, and he has some nice insights. And he writes, JD, which is the Joint Declaration, is the result of 30 years of Lutheran-Roman Catholic dialogue. This fact alone might dissuade many from daring to challenge it. In addition to the first-rate showmanship which 
JD has been presented, it appears that there is neither grub nor gnat that has not been strained out of this cleverly worded document and addenda. There are presuppositions upheld in JD itself which are not stated as such in the official statement. Some of these presuppositions totally negate the biblical justification. For example, the idea that justification is by means of the sacrament of baptism. This is Catholic theology. Such a tradition of men is accepted by both parties to the agreement which in JD states, we confess together that in baptism the Holy Spirit unites one with Christ, justifies and truly renews the person. This heresy is in, the line, in line with the teachings of the Council of Trent. Now here's another point in Catholic doctrine. <clears throat> Protestant doctrine says, I am a sinner. There's nothing sound in me. Who will save me from this body of death? I am a sinner. I receive grace and justification as a gift by faith. It is imputed to me. Whose justice is it that surrounds me? Mine or his? His. Not in Catholic theology. The grace is imparted to you and you become just. You become just. And that is another difference between Protestantism and Catholicism. I remain a fallen human being. I am constantly dependent on Christ. But not in Catholic theology. You become holy. You become perfect. Canon 8 says, If any man shall say that by the said sacrament of the new law grace is not conferred from the work which has been worked, but that faith alone in the divine promise suffices to obtain grace, let him be an anathema. So in other words, if I'm baptized as an infant, I'm justified. Where do you read that in the Bible? Nowhere. Justification has to be by faith. I have to understand it. Canon 9 says, If anyone shall say that by faith alone the sinner is justified, so as to understand that nothing else is required to cooperate in the attainment of grace of justification, and that it is in no way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be an anathema. Canon 11 says, If anyone shall say that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ or by the sole remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace of the charity, which is poured out in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and remains in them, or even that the grace by which we are justified is only the favor of God, let him be an anathema. So now who is responsible for salvation? God or me in this? Me, according to this. He says, error always cloaks itself in reasonably sounding phrases and often makes use of a scheme of the evil one to twist scripture. J.D. is replete with Reformation-like language and scripture quotation. The characteristic vagueness and impreciseness permeates the document. Certain sentences can be read and assented to by a biblical Christian. But when the slant and the meaning is examined, each one is seen to say exactly the opposite. The conclusion arrived at, and I like this statement of his, are similar to the deceptions of Jacob in Genesis chapter 27. The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. The voice of J.D. is distinctly that of Scripture. The hands, however, are the hairy hands of Rome. J.D. imputed righteousness is cleverly sidestepped for the old lie of establishing one's own righteousness. We confess together, it says, that God forgives sin by grace, at the same time frees human beings from sin's enslaving power. You become holy. It's not biblical. Justification is forgiveness of sins and being made righteous. This is what the document says. Which God imparts the gift of a new life since we are all justified, etc. You are made righteous according to this. This is a mixture of justification and sanctification. Justification nowhere in the scripture means inherit righteousness. Being made righteous. 
The believer's justification is not based on a single iota of anything in him. It is based wholly on the standing of Christ. Now here's my question. Who is at stake in this argument? Isn't it Jesus himself? Isn't Jesus at stake here? Who is my king? Who is my king? If I adopt this doctrine, I have a king who is on earth. And if I adopt the biblical standard, I have a king who is in heaven. Now, what was Martin Luther's view on compromise? The negotiation about doctrinal agreement displeases me altogether. For this is utterly impossible unless the Pope has his papacy abolished. He had such a nice way with words. Therefore, avoid and flee those who seek this middle of the road. Think of me after I am dead, and such middle of the road men arise, for nothing good will come of it. There can be no compromise. Martin Luther said, if the article of justification is lost, all Christian doctrine is lost at the same time. The doctrine is the head and the cornerstone. It alone begets, nourishes, builds, preserves and defends the church of God. And without it, the church of God cannot exist for one hour. When the article of justification has fallen, everything has fallen. In the joint document, has it fallen? Yes or no? It has fallen. It has fallen, and Christianity is being duped into believing that Catholicism has adopted Protestant doctrine, which is as far removed from the truth as the East of the West. Let's have a look at Adventist doctrine. The great doctrine of justification by faith so clearly taught by Luther had been almost wholly lost sight of, and the Romish principle of trusting to good works for salvation had taken its place. Then comes a long story of how the Reformers battled through this idea until they accepted that justification, as it was explained by Luther, was the way to go. So the Protestant view of justification... Christ, the Word, that is the Son of God, had two natures, the divine and the human, inseparately enjoined in one person. This is their statement, Protestant statement. Christ's work. Men cannot be justified before God by their own strength, merits or work, but are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith when they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, who by his death, has made satisfaction for our sins. This faith God imputes for righteousness in his sight. Is that perfectly biblical, yes or no? 100%. 100%. Catholic understanding? Justification, transformation of the sinner from unrighteousness to holiness, from son and sonship of God. The term... Diakos, which denotes the transforming of the sinner from the state of unrighteousness to the state of holiness and sonship of God. That's Catholic doctrine. Now we have to be very careful because Protestants, even in my own denomination, like to blur these two. And then Christ becomes less and I become more. We must be very, very careful. Now some will say, Rome has changed. And the Council of Trent that called this an anathema was in the past. Rome is different. So let's ask Bishop Schneider. Bishop Schneider, can you tell us whether the Council of Trent still stands? He's German, so he has a heavy German accent, so listen carefully. He's being asked, Excuse me, Bishop. The Pope said recently on a plane that Martin Luther did not err when it came to justification. Is that true? And then he answered. And you must listen to his answer. Your, Ex Your Excellency, thank you for being here today. My question is, since the discussion is about heresy, one heretic who comes to mind is Martin Luther, whose 500th anniversary of the Reformation, uh, the Pope will be commemorating um, and very, very shortly. Uh, on an airplane interview, the Pope recently said that Martin Luther quote, did not err on the issue of justification. Uh, what is your response to the Lutheran heresy and uh, on the issue of justification and the upcoming ecumenical events? 
and how do traditional Catholics respond to uh, the reports that are coming out? We have already had an infallible response to the errors of Martin Luther, the Council of Trent. <laughs> of the Council of Trends about the errors of Luther and be an infallible ex cathedra and the comments of the Pope in the play are not ex cathedra. So what did he say? The teachings of the Council of Trent, do they stand yes or no? Yes, yes because they were ex cathedra infallible. They were taken on the bishop's seat. A pope can say anything he wants off that seat. It doesn't matter. Only what he says on that seat is infallible. So you can say all kinds of things and get away with it. So do Lutherans and Catholics agree on justification? This is Rolf Preuss, a Protestant Lutheran theologian. He says this difference in the doctrine of sin is reflected also in the difference in the doctrine of justification. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that the sinner is justified on account of the change that God works within him, and the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that justification conforms us to the righteousness of God, who makes us inwardly just by the power of his mercy. That's not true. I retain a sinful nature. If you want to practice this, then do some carpentry, and use a 12-point hammer to bash a nail home and miss and strike your finger. And see how much perfection there is in you with what comes out of your mouth. So this is totally the opposite. Here is Steps to Christ. Here's an Adventist thought. Listen carefully. It is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunken. Our hearts are evil and we cannot change them. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Quoting the scripture, not one. The carnal mind is enmity with God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, quoting Job and Romans. Education, culture, the exercise of the will, human effort, all have their proper sphere, but here they are powerless. They may produce an outward correctness of behavior, but they cannot change the heart. They cannot purify the springs of life. There must be a power working from within, a new life from above, before men can be changed from sin to holiness. That power is Christ. His grace alone can quicken the lifeless faculties of the self and attract it to God, to holiness. It is not enough to perceive the loving kindness of God, to see the benevolence, the fatherly tenderness of his character. It is not enough to discern the wisdom and justice of his law, to see that it is founded on eternal principles of love. Paul saw all of this when he exclaimed, I consent unto the law that it is good. The law is holy, the commandments holy, just and good. But he added in bitterness of soul and anguish and despair, I am carnal, sold unto sin. He longed for the purity, the righteousness to which he himself was powerless to attain and cried out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Such is the cry that has gone up from burdened hearts in all lands and all ages to all these but one answer. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. Is this Reformed theology, yes or no? This is Reformed theology. The whole heart must be yielded to God or the change can never be wrought in us by which we are to be restored to his likeness. By nature we are alienated from God. The Holy Spirit describes our condition in words such as these. Dead in trespasses and sin. The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. faint no soundness in it. We are held fast in the snare of Satan taken captive at his will. And all these quotes... God desires to heal us, to set us free. But since this requires an entire transformation, a renewing of our whole nature, we must yield ourselves wholly to Him. 
So two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed and thus and said to himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, as extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week, I give tithes. You know the text. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful for me as a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. This is about justification. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, but he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. This is true salvation. I want to be a breast beater. I don't want to be a publican. I want to say, Lord, I deserve death, but by faith I appropriate your grace and I thank you for your salvation. That's Protestantism. The one who is great then is Jesus and the one who is in need is me. The other one is presumption at the highest level. Let's take a short break and then it gets worse. Sorry. Sorry.